Uh, I've been looking forward to this event for some time. It's been absolutely uh, uh, fascinating. I actually um, did carry an organ donor card, but I've lost it. So um, <laughs> this is going to be a key moment for me tonight. I used to actually carry two cards. I had an organ donor card. I also had a card which I was very proud of, which I'd had in my wallet for, I think, 20 years, um, uh, which was produced, I think, by the Labour Party. Uh, and it was when Margaret Thatcher used to regularly turn up after our tragedies and visit people in the, ho in the hospital beds. And it was a card saying, I do not wish to be visited by Margaret Thatcher. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> if anything awful happens to me. But that's churlish left-wing nonsense, and I've put it all behind me. Uh, you'll be delighted to see. Um, a couple of uh, interesting facts also before we um, begin. I'm, I'm speakers, I'm, I'm still in their thunder because I'm sure one of them was going to say these things. But uh, first of all, Wales will become the first part of the UK to move to opt out uh, organ donations, um, following an announcement by the Welsh Health Minister at the end of 2009. Other countries who followed this route include Spain, Belgium and Turkey. And in 2011, Israel will bring in a unique system for encouraging organ donations. Donor card holders and their immediate family will get priority treatment over non-card holders. Interesting questions there. Now, we have three distinguished panellists to debate this evening's topic. Uh, Chris Rudge, uh, AC Grayling and Professor James Neuberger, I'm going to tell you uh, just one line about each of them before they speak, so you know who they are. So first of all, uh, before they speak, but uh, um, first of all, let's start off with uh, Chris Rudge. Each speaker, by the way, is going to speak for about 10 minutes, in fact, precisely 10 minutes, I'll certainly know more than 10 minutes, and then I'm going to talk to them for a while, and then we'll open up uh, to the room. Um, so first of all, Chris Rudge, who's National Clinical Director for Transplantation at the Department for Health, with responsibility for implementation of the Organ Donation Task Force recommendations. Chris, over to you. Organ donation, transplantation, in fact, is often described as one of the modern miracles of medicine. Uh, it's been a dream for thousands of years. Uh, saints Cosmos and Damien are the patron saints of transplantation. In the fourth century, they are depicted as having taken the gangrenous leg uh, from an individual and transplanted the leg of a Moorish servant who may or may not have been a willing donor. Um, <laughs> It's been a dream for a long time. It came to reality, really, for the first time in 1954, December 1954, the first successful transplant in the world in, in Boston, the USA. And it gained, I suppose, public uh, recognition with Chris Barnard's first heart transplant in 1967. But I don't think, and it's very successful. Transplantation now is very successful. But I don't think it's a miracle because the surgery is fantastic, although it is. I don't think it's a miracle because the drugs that stop rejection are wonderful, although they are. It's a miracle because it's, I think, almost unique, if not entirely unique, in that the treatment of one individual, the recipient, requires the donor, requires somebody to give them the organ. And I think it's that that makes it unique, and I think, it, I think it's that aspect of it that makes it so fascinating for those of us that are involved, but also raises the sort of questions we're going to discuss this evening. Um, and we talk about donation, we talk about donors and organ donation. Um, the word, of course, stems from giving. Uh, and we talk about giving. I, unconsciously this morning I was in, in a clinic and I saw a patient who'd received a transplant, a kidney from one of their relatives a few weeks ago. And I said, who was it that gave you the kidney? Who gave you the, that was the word I used, unconsciously. And all the way through our, our, our practice of transplantation, we talk about giving. We enshrine it in legislation, certainly in this country, where living donors cannot sell a kidney. And most parts of the world have legislation which ban the buying and selling of organs, the commercialization of it. It's based on giving. We, we enshrine it in legislation in terms of donation after death because um, that requires consent. It requires active consent, either from the individual given during their own life or from family members or others acting on their behalf. Although, of course, in Scotland, we don't talk about consent, we talk about authorization, and that's a very interesting difference. But we do talk about consent, so it's active, it's all to do with giving. Um, and I just wonder whether that's one of the reasons why 
the subject of presumed consent or opting out becomes controversial because under opting out legislation, people would be entitled to take the organs from an individual who had not opted out. Take, and that changes the concept. It's taking, not giving. And I wonder if that's why some people find the concept of presumed consent or opting out so difficult. It changes the whole framework. The problem is, though, that, as we all know, um, although transplantation is hugely successful, there aren't enough people that are willing to give their organs, either in life or after death. And just very briefly, I'd like to, 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 to mention a few of the reasons why I think people don't agree to donate their organs. There are two aspects, and I think sometimes we talk about them as though they're the same, but they're not, they're different. One aspect is people who say, in life, I would like, when I die, to donate my organs. I'll put my name on the organ donor register. Now, those people are not donors. They're simply people that have said, when I die, I would like to donate my organs. And I think if I'm brutal, the only reason, or the main reason, that people don't put their name on the organ donor register is not because they don't agree with organ donation, not because they're not willing to be givers. It's because they don't get round to it. And a huge amount of work is being done to try and encourage people to get round to it. But the other aspect of donation and, uh, and the other area in which it, it doesn't always work is when it happens in practice, when somebody dies in hospital in circumstances where they could donate their organs. Round about four times out of ten, either they or their family speaking on their behalf do not give consent for organ donation. Four times out of ten. We know some of the reasons, but I don't think we really have got into the complexities of why people say no. They say no because they say their relative has suffered enough. Illogical because their relative is now dead, but understandable. Um, they say no because their religion doesn't allow it. Well, that is broadly speaking inaccurate. Um, there are experts in the audience who can say far more than I about that, but broadly speaking there's no major religion in the world that has a fundamental objection to organ donation and transplantation. And I think they say no because there's been a shift over the last 10 or 15 years that we've all lived through where doctors and medicine are no longer held in the high regard that they used to be held in 20 or 30 years ago. And Dr. Shipman and the older Hay problems and Bristol children and so on and so forth have changed, I think, the relationship between, of trust between individuals and doctors. But ultimately it comes back, I suppose, to to what people think about death and what they think about the body and how the body should be treated and respected after death. And I come back to the fact that although transplantation is hugely successful, there aren't enough people that donate their organs. Three people will have died today on average and three people will die tomorrow <laughs> who are waiting for a transplant. And so although overwhelmingly the population <coughs> support organ donation in principle, they say, yes, I'll give my organs after my death, doesn't translate into practice. And I'll be very interested in tonight's discussion as to see how we translate that broad concept of giving and willingness to give into action. Thank you very much. AC Grayling, doesn't really need much introduction by me, Professor of Philosophy at Birkbeck College, University of London, author of innumerable best-selling books, including The Meaning of Things and The Reason of Things. Um, Over to you. Thanks so much. All right. If I just sit here and talk, is that okay? Uh, but, but one reason why I wish to do so is that I just felt my braces ping off at the back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to give the idea of organ donation a whole new... Uh... <laughs> a central concept in this uh, discussion is the concept of altruism, which is a, a particular case and, and a particularly vexed one of uh, the kind of interest that we have in the welfare of others. Now, if one takes a couple of steps back and thinks a little bit about the very possibility of a moral community, that is, say, a, a, a society in which people have enough interest in the welfare of others to treat them with a minimum, at least, degree of courtesy, uh, of kindness, of uh, um, uh, intention to get along and to cooperate with them in the normal affairs of, of daily life, one recognizes that this idea of 
taking into account the needs, the interests, the desires of other people and adjusting one's behavior towards them accordingly is at the, at the very base of the, of the possibility of community. There couldn't be a society, there couldn't be a community without at least some um, minimum degree and it would have actually to be quite a considerable degree of, of that uh, non-conscious very often and sometimes conscious sentiment towards other people which made the idea of a, a moral life, a moral community possible. And as an aspect of that, the idea of doing something very active, that is of giving something from one's own resources, whether it's one's own organs or money or time, uh, to other people in the interests of their welfare, in the interests of trying to promote something that they, the other, uh, feels to be important. That is an uh, aspect of the uh, idea of moral activism, moral action, which is crucial to the bonds that keep a society together. Um, when you have too much selfishness or too, too, too much individualism or too little concern for uh, the other uh, and you get bad consequences flowing from that, the rest of the community gets up in arms. I don't know whether you saw that there was a report in the newspaper today about an elderly couple who died in their bungalow uh, during the cold weather because no carers came or no um, agencies who had been telephoned and, and asked to come and, and look into their welfare had turned up and this elderly couple died. And there is a general sense of outrage. People cluck their tongues and shake their heads over that kind of thing because they, they see it as a failure of the community, of individual members of the community, in doing enough to ensure that the interests of others are taken into account. So this, this idea of having certain obligations towards others, of having um, uh, certain demands made upon oneself which are justified, they're justified demands, that one has a part to play uh, is, is a very general idea and in it this idea of giving, of doing something actively, of, of choosing to part with some of one's own resources in the interests of others is, is very central to that idea. It would be a very empty moral notion of having a sense of community and of being aware that others have interests and needs if one never uh, gave of one's, one's resources in some way. Now the concept of altruism, or at the very least the word altruism, was uh, introduced, as you know, because you were doubtless reading him in the bath just last night, Auguste Comte back in the middle of the 19th century. It's a pretty late arrival uh, on, the, on the scene of debate in ethics. And it, it has a, a special kind of resonance because it implies, not invariably, but in, in many cases, that a genuinely altruistic act is one which benefits another at a cost to the altruist. I mean, if you benefit another in a way that also benefits you, as in the sort of best outcome in game theory, let us say, or if you act in ways which are uh, beneficial to society because society's benefit is beneficial to you, then you, you're not doing something or giving something at a cost to yourself, a net cost to yourself, because there is a, a benefit to yourself. And we know now from all the debate in sociobiology and evolutionary psychology and so on that questions arise about the nature of apparent altruism, uh, the argument being that perhaps a lot of what looks like altruism in, is in fact just uh, enhancing opportunities for one's genes or one's kin or, 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 or one's society. But the idea of doing something for somebody else which carries a cost for oneself, that is the idea which, as I say, not invariably, but, but uh, generally characterizes this idea of altruism. And donating an organ, let us say, to a relative, to, to one's child, would be a very good example of a, a genuine act of, of altruism. This would genuinely be a benefit to the other, and it would genuinely involve a cost to oneself, and it could even be a serious cost. The idea of being an organ donor after death uh, doesn't, in fact, carry such a cost. Being an organ donor after death has advantages for oneself. Should one oneself come to need a, an organ transplanted from somebody else into one's own body, then being a member of a society in which organ donation is a, a generally recognized good and generally acted on, that everybody becomes potential donors, uh, has a benefit potentially to oneself. So it wouldn't be an act of altruism to be a, a, a general organ donor, the, uh, an after-death organ donor, but it would obviously be something which, uh, in common with a lot of other people in society, would have a large overall benefit for society as a whole. But in fact, the difference between the genuine altruist and the person who sees that there is a general good to be served by being an organ donor is not the thing which is of 
great significance in this particular arena. Because in this particular uh, arena, um, we have a number of factors in play. We have advances in medical technology and technique, which uh, in involve giving normal and flourishing lives to people who, before transplants became possible, uh, might, might very well have died and have suffered before they died. Um, we have uh, an, uh, an increasing awareness in society that because of these technologies in, in medicine, because of the possibilities that they involve, that, that, that there is a, a general good to be served here if we all of us become members of the organ donor register. And yet what we don't have is enough people signing up. We're still having three people a day dying because um, they, they don't get the organs that they need. Where, therefore, are the barriers? Where are the difficulties? Well, obviously enough, there's a, a very general sentiment. If people say, oh, yes, it would be a good thing if people give their organs. Oh, I, I wouldn't mind if, if I were dead. But then um, th th these hesitations and, and uh, reservations come into play when you're faced, somebody you love who has died, and the um, medical staff come and say, could we please have the corneas or the kidneys or the liver or heart and lungs or, or something of somebody you care very much about and you're in that extremely vulnerable window of grief uh, immediately after losing somebody and it's very, very hard to think, to imagine um, that loved one's body being opened by surgeons and organs removed and an incomplete body being returned. I don't know whether you know, but uh, when um, the uh, eunuchs, of whom there were very many in the Forbidden City, were turfed out of the Forbidden City in about 1920, um, they all refused to go until they were given their little boxes back that had the significant bits that had been removed uh, for, as part of their employment conditions. Because the Chinese uh, had this view, and perhaps still to some extent do, that they should return to their ancestors whole. This is why having a, a, um, a hand amputated or a leg or uh, an ear sliced off or part of a nose, all of which were uh, punishments that the um, Chinese inflicted on mal malefactors uh, in the past, was a, a terrible thing because they would go back to their ancestors incomplete. And so they, they wouldn't go until they got their little boxes back. And all they do really, what that example does, is to encapsulate this feeling that the, the wholeness or the uh, integrity even of, of a dead body, can matter tremendously to people, which is why, um, given that death is nothing to the person who is dead, dying, of course, is a, a, a matter of great moment to all of us, but being dead is a quite separate thing. Death is about the living and the grieving. And very often there are major anxieties uh, about this, about the integrity of the body and, and the sensitivities that surround it on the part of the grieving. And that is one major barrier, not just for people at the time that somebody dies, but for people thinking about becoming organ donors. They may think, what will my family feel when I'm dead? Will they be able to cope with that? Uh, would I be able to cope with it if it was my mother or my daughter and so on? So th there are these major psychological barriers in addition to the ones that have already been mentioned by Chris, uh, like the, the religious ones, although again you're quite right that um, with the exception of uh, certain strands of Judaism and Catholic Christianity, uh, which is why they don't cremate but uh, are buried because there's a belief about the resurrection of the body eventually and so on, that, that there are some scruples but there are no major doctrinal reasons why people shouldn't donate part of their bodies when they die. And so most of the reasons are psychological ones. And the effort to overcome those psychological barriers to organ donation, I think has to come in part at very least from a return to what I started with, which is the general point about the good that's served by acting in ways that are genuinely in the interests of society as a whole and of individuals in society. And one can make that kind of case by reference to oneself, because it's a perfectly reasonable argument to say, wouldn't you like to be a member of a society where these things are done in general, that benefit everybody and could perhaps benefit you, wouldn't you like to be a member of such a society? That is a key argument and one which I think needs to be urged. Thank you. Our third and final speaker is Professor James Neuberger. He's Associate Medical Director at NHS Blood and Transplant and Professor of Hepatology at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, Birmingham. James. Thanks. It's very hard to follow both the introduction and the previous speakers, um, and particularly in this audience. There are a lot of people with huge amounts of experience in transplantation. I'm uh, a liver physician by background, and um, 
I've been asked to talk about a, 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 a little bit about the, in, the consequences of donation. I think many of you realise that we talk about org, organ donors and organ recipients, but of course, depending on the organ, uh, life is very different pre transplant, the kidney recipient who's on dialysis three, four times a week, has to watch their diet, has to go for dialysis. The liver, heart, lung recipient, basically waiting, race against time, are they going to die on the list? And we have up to one in eight people dying on the list before they get a transplant. We have the person uh, with, with intestinal failure on uh, intravenous feeding, often going yellow and so on. So life on the whole, for those awaiting transplant, is pretty miserable. Well, say go on the list, uh, 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 um, that's one hurdle achieved, but it raises more problems. And for most people, they say that life is on hold until they get that phone call. They hate it because they're not in control, there's stress, there's anxiety, and of course there's guilt because they feel that they're waiting for somebody to die so that they can get a, an organ. It's perhaps worth also mentioning, of course, we talk about the major solid organs, but we're seeing around the world face hand and indeed other organs uh, being transplanted but um, the majority of course are kidneys. So life on, on the waiting list is pretty grim for people, it's grim for their families and that also of course makes guilt for the patient who's waiting and is aware of the impact. They can't travel and you can imagine what life is like, a race against time and for some people, particularly those waiting for a kidney transplant, it may be two or three years. Every time the phone goes, you think, is this the time? Am I going to get the liver? Have I got to rush with the bad weather? How am I going to get to hospital? And so on. Life after transplant uh, um, is usually excellent. It's not entirely normal. People usually are on long-term immunosuppression. They have side effects. And certainly in the liver transplant patients, we know that those who survive the operation, they still live eight or ten years less than the normal population. So although life is excellent, they can do things that normal people do, travel, have babies, um, depending on what organs are transplanted, I suppose. Uh, uh, um, we've had patients climbing Kilimanjaro. There's a plan for patients to go up Everest post-transplant and so on. Life is excellent, but it's not normal because they're on immunosuppression. But there are other feelings too. Particularly after the first few weeks of transplant, they get over the pain, the loss of control, the loss of dignity that's unfortunately inevitable in hospital. Enormous feeling of guilt comes in, and it's round about, in my experience, about three to four months where they start to feel guilty because they've received an organ from a deceased person. And I still remain slightly surprised, but it's a constant feature, the enormous emotional impact of writing a thank you letter to the donor family. Patients come in tears, you know they're going to raise it because they come in with their families, they're hesitant, they're in tears, and it's a huge cathartic step for them. And it is remarkable, this is not just saying thank you for the socks I got at Christmas, but it's a recognition, I think, of the, the uh, Zeta Groening said that, that altruism is donation, but at a cost. And, and I think that that's a huge feeling. I also just want to say a little bit about altruistic donation and, and, and living donation. We've talked a lot about deceased donation when a patient's already dead, but we have an increasingly so living donation, and particularly for uh, non-kidneys, this comes at a potential cost to the patient. And for liver, for liver donors, where part of the liver can be donated to a member of the family, uh, uh, um, there's a risk of death. Even in the best centres, in the best selected patients, there's a risk of maybe one or one in, one in 200 or one in 300 that you, a surgeon will take a healthy patient, give them an operation they don't directly benefit from, and kill them. And this has enormous impact on everybody, the public, the nation, particularly, of course, the families and the surgeons. And, and one has to be aware that, again, this is donation that comes at a cost. Kidney donation, there have been around the world the occasional reported deaths, none in the UK, but again, it's not something that's free of risk, not only of death, but long term. <coughs> Altruistic donation also, uh, uh, the very fact we have it induces problems because if you are going to give, if you are not going to give, there's always an Im 
implicit assumption, why aren't they giving me their kidney? And although it's like the elephant in the room, it's often not said, that raises issues which we don't always, I think, address adequately. We do our best, but it can't be done fully. And then, of course, there's the truly altruistic donor, the patient, the, the normal person who contacts a transplant team saying, I'd like to give a kidney, and I don't care to whom it goes to. Now, I used to think those people were completely mad. Uh, and no doubt some of them are. But there's a significant number, and we see a growing number of donors, altruistic donors. They're very, very carefully assessed. I wouldn't like to be a surgeon who operates on them, but they're people who are genuinely altruistic. They're aware of the risks, and they really want to donate, usually kidneys. Occasionally, we get people asking for lung. Uh, we haven't yet had a heart altruistic donor. Uh, um, and Margaret Thatcher perhaps wouldn't qualify. Um, but... Uh, um, you mean because she lacks one? Right? Yeah. Um, sorry. Um, no, I didn't say that. It, it's just a transport issue. Um, but... Um, and, of course, also it's a ra it, 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 it raises issues that it's sometimes hard to receive as well as to give. And I think all these issues do come out and once you start raising these issues amongst families, it raises all sorts of issues beyond transplantation as, as, as well. But there's no doubt that for the huge majority of patients awaiting transplant, although it's not an easy option for them or their family, there's no doubt it makes a huge difference and people return to a normal quality of life. And in my experience, most of them over compensate and go out and achieve often superb things. So it makes a huge difference to people and their families. Thank you.